Welcome to Tales of Britain and Ireland. This is a podcast telling the stories, legends and folk tales of Britain and Ireland in no particular order. Presented by Graham and coming direct from South Yorkshire, each episode tells a story or selection of stories from all across these islands and throughout their history, followed by a short and decidedly inexpert discussion of the origin and themes of each tale. This time we've got another episode which is a compilation of shorter tales with a common theme. Bold and original idea, you might be thinking. Not what all the other storytelling podcasts are doing, oh no. And that theme, if you hadn't guessed it by the episode title, is Stone Circles. And in keeping with what we've done in other episodes like this, we'll do a bit of background on this before we leap into the stories. What is a stone circle? Well, definitions are tricky and language inexact, but I think we can safely say it's stones of a reasonable size stuck into or onto the ground arranged in a, well, a circle or a ring or or something kind of circular. And the important caveat that we're going to add to this is that we're talking here about such arrangements of stone that were made many thousands of years ago. Now, stone circles are among the most visible remains of Stone Age and Bronze Age cultures on the landscape of the British Isles. There are other structures that have lasted from those distant eras, individual standing stones, burial mounds, but there's so much to say about the circles, we're just going to focus on them. Now there's a good chance that, especially if you're not native to these islands, that you are now picturing Stonehenge. A world famous heritage location, right up there for top tier recognisability with the pyramids, the Great Wall of China, Taj Mahal and 742 Evergreen Terrace. And Stonehenge is a breathtakingly impressive place. But you might also be picturing a different circle. For there are a dazzling constellation of them, in all kinds of different styles, sizes and configurations. To name a few, there's Avebury in Wiltshire, the biggest of the British stone circles, a quarter of a mile around, consisting of one huge circle on a raised mound, with an internal ditch that was once nine metres deep, and that circle has two smaller circles inside of it. Now Avebury has none of the impressive flat lintels of Stonehenge, but its outer circle alone once contained 100 stones, 4 metres high, weighing up to 40 tonnes each. Big enough is the circle that today, within it, there are houses, shops, two A-roads, a chapel, and, most English of all, a pub. In contrast, on the Bearer Peninsula in County Kerry, there's a stone circle not three metres across, consisting of only five small, wide, thin stones, still just about standing, but towering over all of them, like a grizzly at a teddy bear's picnic, is an imposing three metre tall standing stone. A very peculiar sight indeed. There's the Nine Ladies in Derbyshire, which I mention as it's my local stone circle. Nine unremarkable stones, each less than a metre high, on a small moor, with a further stone seemingly flung a few metres away. And yet, squat and low though those stones may be, they still hold an enchanting appeal, attracting visitors all year round. And I could go on. I really, really could. I have not even mentioned any of the circles we'll be covering in the stories today yet. And I could do so because, all told, there are nearly 1,300 surviving stone circles in the British Isles, with about 500 of those being in Scotland. It turns out that these ancient mysterious monuments are surprisingly common. Now of course they are not only a phenomena of these islands. The seemingly immutable borders that exist between nations today meant very little even a few hundred years ago. And 5,000 years ago they were basically as comprehensible and relevant as the instructions to a Casio pocket calculator written in Klingon. So stone circles can be found in many places in what we now call Europe, and there are even similar structures in parts of Africa. Though that said, the British Isles does seem to have a bit of a concentration of them. Now, stone circles can inspire deep emotions in people. Awe, reverence, wonder. That feeling that they are special places, well, it's probably enhanced as not all of them, but many of them, those that have survived today at least, are in lonely, rural or wild places, in farmlands or on remote hilltops, moorlands, hidden in forests, on far-flung islands. This furthers the appeal of stone circles and the sense of them as places of lost magics from the very dawn of human civilization. 
once sacred places where we can even now reach out through the centuries to people and places long gone but whose traces still remain. That most of the surviving stone circles are in what are now remote locations is probably less to do with our ancestors' love of the wilderness than with what has happened in places we now think of as not remote. In the intervening five millennia, there's been quite a lot of activity there that would have obliterated the traces of any such monuments. And as well as them having just been taken down because they were in the way, or having suffered due to natural causes, stone circles have not always been as popular as they are now, and certain members of the Christian church over the last thousand years or so have played a rather active role in their destruction. Given all this, it's somewhat astounding that so many have survived, though some of the larger have had a great deal of help in recent years. You may or may not be surprised to learn that Stonehenge, for instance, didn't look quite how it does now a hundred years ago. There are some old photos online. Go and look them up if you're interested. Now, I know that this isn't a history or an archaeology podcast, but it feels like we should alight briefly on the origins of these stone circles. Who built them and what were they for? As Ilvis asked in her heartfelt song Stonehenge, What's the meaning of Stonehenge? And now your mind might be going to Druids, because the association between Druids and stone circles has been indelibly inscribed into the cultural imagination. Not surprising, as it's been theorised since the 18th century at least. And to be fair, modern Druidic religions and practices, and other modern pagan religions, those religions formed largely in the 20th century, certainly do have a very strong connection to stone circles. For these religions, stone circles are often holy places. However, if we're asking the question of who built the stone circles, well, it might help if you realise that the ancient druids and the modern druids are to each other as fictional Westerosian know-nothing Jon Snow is to long-time BAFTA award-winning Channel 4 news presenter and journalist Jon Snow. By which I mean they share a common name and not much else. The ancient druids, about whom we know sadly very little indeed, were active roughly about two to two and a half thousand years ago, and nothing at all suggests they had anything to do with the stone circles. And they certainly didn't build them, as the circles are far older than two thousand years old. Now, personally, I don't feel that that lessens the magic of the stone circles. In fact, I feel that if you start off believing they were built by the Druids just before the Romans arrived, then the circles only become even more impressive when you realise that we here are about as close in time to the Druids as the Druids were to the makers of the stone circles. In fact, for the very oldest stone circles, they're even further back than that. Might be getting a bit lost here. The point is that by the time of the Druids, the stone circles were already unimaginably old. And while we have no idea what the Druids thought of the stone circles, it's not entirely preposterous to imagine a Druid 2,000 years ago regarding stone circles with just as much wonder, awe, magic and mystery as we do today. These monuments are so old that they long predate written history in these lands, and they've survived right through the Druids and to this day. So, the Druids didn't make them. But who did? And what were they for? And here is where it gets even more difficult. Because you can't sum it up like that. And I'm not trying to avoid the question, but all the evidence we have shows that A. We know even less about the people who built them than the Druids, and there were probably lots of different people who built them. And B. What we can be sure of was there were loads of different purposes, and often different purposes for the same stone circle, at different times. These things were constructed and used over hundreds of years and thousands in some cases. Sites were used for hundreds of years, abandoned and then reused. And asking what they're for is kind of similar to looking at the country now and saying, well, what are all the brick buildings for? It's an answerable question, but there's no one answer. There's lots of them. There is pretty certain evidence that some of them were used as burial grounds, likely as ritual places for burying and remembering the dead. There are also signs that point to some stone circles corresponding to significant astronomical events and linking them with heavenly bodies. 
While it seems likely that others may have been places of worship and community events, with some similarities to your churches or your mosques today. Places to gather, places to worship. All in all, there was likely a sacredness to many of these structures. But really, this is mostly speculation. What we do know is that they were certainly very important. As erecting blocks weighing several tons and constructing the associated earthworks would have required tremendous amounts of labour. The sewn circles mattered. But you didn't listen to this podcast to hear me witter on about the things I barely know about stone circles. I mean, I think you didn't. I've not really got the stats to analyse, but I imagine you came here for the stories. And there are quite a few, because stone circles kind of tempt people to make stories about them. These circles have been part of the landscape for as long as people have been writing stories down. And the mystery of their origins is basically crying out for an explanatory story or stories. And that cry has been heard and responded to many times throughout the centuries. Now, as we've seen before, popular folk tales tend to get spread around and localised. So a story about the origins of one stone circle very quickly becomes a story about the origin of lots of stone circles. And quite often you'll be unsurprised to learn that these stories are petrifying. And in our first short story today, we'll cover one of the most archetypal British folk tales about the origin of stone circles. It was a fine, warm summer's evening in the Somerset village of Stanton Drew. It could not have been better weather for the wedding party that was just beginning. The church ceremony had been earlier that Saturday afternoon, and now most of the village's inhabitants had made their way to a large field just outside the village that was all set out for a truly spectacular celebration. The river was a convenient distance away for any needs, and there was fire and food and alcohol, and the sounds of merriment drifted up into the evening sky. This was all at a time when celebrations of any kind were rare and special things indeed. Long days were spent working in the fields, maintaining households, and doing the hundred and one all arduous and lengthy tasks necessary just to exist in these times, well before the modern developments that would overhaul rural life. And on Sundays, the day of rest, well then there was church to attend, sermons to listen to, and all kinds of ways to occupy your time thinking about how great God was, and not having fun. So a wedding like this was a huge event, not just as a celebration of the couple and their life together, but as time for people to just get out, to meet one another, and to have a damn good party. Such opportunities had to be grasped with both hands, doubly so for the younger men and women of the village. They had no clubs to go to, no way of sharing TikToks, or whatever it is that kids do these days. This offered a precious chance to meet in relative freedom, where they could talk and dance and laugh and show off, and no doubt, flirt outrageously. And a spark that night might well light the bright flames of another wedding a few months hence. And the cycle would continue. So it's not really that important who the couple were, this was for the community, for everyone. The bride and groom, their friends and family, the vicar who had wed them, all were enjoying a great evening. There was sport, wrestling and such like, there was feasting, there was gossip. But above all, there was that lifeblood of community, music, music and dancing. A piper played the tunes and local amateur musicians joined in on makeshift drums and penny whistles. The evening turned to night, darkness fell, and the field was illuminated by three great fires. The other activities subsided, and the music and the dancing took over for one and all. As midnight approached, the energy in the many guests who remained was still as strong as it had been earlier in the day. More so, in fact, buoyed up by inebriation, the roar of the fire, and the coolness of the night. Perfect dancing weather for sets that required strength, exertion and precision. To swing partners round and round, to skip and wheel with abandon, and to do so mostly while avoiding collisions. The party was really in full swing, so you can perhaps understand the frustration when, 
couple of minutes before the church clock struck 12, the piper reached the end of his current tune, let the notes hang in the air, and started to put his pipes away. The dancing, smiling couples were recovering their breath in what they thought would be a momentary pause. And then the bride realised. No, hang on, what? The surprised woman and a few of her guests went over to the piper, who seemed to be preparing to depart. Uh, Excuse me? Uh, What are you doing? You're to play. Is this about money? Get a hat going round for the piper, came the cry from a generous guest, and people started reaching into pouches for pennies. No, ma'am, thank you, but no, for this has been a marvellous celebration. But Sunday draws very near, and the Sabbath day has but one purpose, the worship of our Lord. He commanded that we must keep it holy, not work, nor play, but worship him. And were that hat come to me full to the brim with all the jewels in Christendom, I could not be compelled to play on into the Sabbath. The bride was somewhat dumbfounded at receiving this impromptu sermon from her piper, but as he continued to gather up his belongings, she refound her voice. But it's only just begun. Look, if you're worried, the vicar's over there. She indicated the somewhat intoxicated vicar. He raised a tankard. Hello! That's as may be, but you take your chances and I'll take mine. And with that, the piper set off into the darkness. Everyone kind of stood around looking awkward. The clock struck midnight. Right. Well, is there anyone else here who can play? Everyone else is happy to stay, yes? A few of the more pious types slunk off as well, quietly and discreetly, but most of the party felt as the bride did. It had basically just begun. The groom spoke up. Anyone else play? Anyone got an instrument? The bride joined in. Don't be shy. We'll pay you what you want, or we'll go to heaven or hell if we need to. Just want to keep this party rolling. No sooner were those very unwise words out of her lips than a tall man dressed all in black stood up from just outside of the circle of firelight where he must have been seated. He was carrying a fiddle with him of some rare quality. He raised the instrument to his chin and drew his bow across the strings. The sudden sound in the silence drew everyone's attention. Aha! went the bride, suddenly exuberant. Excellent! And the people took up their partner's hands again as the music started up in earnest. The fiddler played a merry jig, and the company whirled around and around, laughing and whooping as they did. And when the first tune came to an end, the next one began, and after that, the next. The vicar, somewhat perspiring and a little out of breath, decided he would be best off to sit this one out. So he stopped dancing. No. What? No. He he stopped dancing. Stop! He yelled at his feet, but his feet and his arms, well... They weren't paying attention to him anymore. He looked around. Most of the others were still enjoying the music, but he could see some others like him. They'd noticed. They were wildly looking around, fear in their eyes. The fires crackled and roared. The people danced. As his feet moved in time with the rhythm and his hands swung around him, the vicar, slowly, trembling, turned his head to the fiddler. The fiddler, who smiled a nasty little smile, and stamped his cloven hooves in time with the music. The vicar opened his mouth and he screamed. The piper, who set up camp in a nearby field, heard the screams, the shrieks, the cries. He shook in terror, he covered his ears and the howling continued the whole night long. The next morning, those villagers who had gone home early or who had not been in attendance found the pious man, still covering his ears, almost out of his mind with fright. But as for the huge wedding party, 
they did not find them. But in their place, arrayed around the smouldering ashes of bonfires, in between abandoned crockery and dropped bottles, were three circles of huge standing stones, each stone roughly the size of a person. And the circles remain to this very day, a warning to all to keep the Sabbath holy and of the dangers of words said in haste. And yes, here we have the most common explanation for stone circles. Their people turn to stone. And, spoilers I'm afraid, but not big ones. This theme might crop up again later in this episode. Now for our next tale, we go about a hundred miles northeast, and many hundreds of years back in time. To a time when every village didn't boast a church, and the sanctity of keeping the Sabbath was not known to every English man and woman. This was a time when the idea of England was fresh and new, and by no means would this idea necessarily survive, for the nascent country was still fought over, by armies of Danes, by the successors to the various Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, by lords with grand ambitions, dynastic struggles pitting fathers against sons. Power, war and intrigue were the sports of the rich and the powerful, and the lot of the common folk at this time was to work and to suffer. The more things change, eh? There was a king. There were a number of kings at the time. But the particular king we are focused on here? We don't know where he came from. Did he come from Europe or Scandinavia? Was he an Anglo-Saxon or a Briton? Was he Christian or pagan? But what we do know was that he had recently achieved some great success. He and his army had found themselves on the victorious side of many a battle and fought a bloody swathe across the land in a war of conquest. It had been difficult. The king had had to sacrifice the lives of many of his men but that was all part of the burden of kingship. While he mourned them, it was all necessary, wasn't it? If he was to rule. And he was to rule. Not once did it cross this warrior king's mind that there might be another way to live. A way that didn't involve imploring others to die hideous and violent deaths. The prospect of settling down, getting married to someone for love, not because you needed that alliance with Pepin the Short. Raising a couple of kids who wouldn't try to murder you. Maybe starting an artisanal bakery, working on etchings in the evenings. None of this ever occurred to the king. All this land would be his, and when he started this expedition out, that possibility had some pretty long odds on it. Now, well now, the field had narrowed considerably, and his proposition was beginning to look a bit more like the sure bet. Nevertheless, his army by this point was somewhat reduced in size. Those remaining had spent the night in some barren field, and the hundred or so of them were breakfasting in the very early morning light. Ahead of them lay villages and towns where more men would join their cause, provisions would be refreshed, and the successful army would be strengthened and revitalised. At least, this was the king's view of his strategy and it was still one that just about held sway amongst the rest of his loyal men. But on this morning, as the king wandered away from his army to survey the valley in front of them and plan out the course of action for the day, a small group of five of his most senior knights had gone out for their own innocent morning stroll, in the direction away from the king. And they were at this very moment some way away from the army, having a hushed conversation about senior leadership performance targets and succession planning. But the king was confident. The scent of the wildflowers and the singing of the birds in the meadow as he approached the top of the small hill was almost intoxicating. And it might have been for this reason that he only noticed the small aged woman when he was almost at the very crest of the hill. She stood in front of him, wizened, bent over, and yet... When she spoke, her voice carried as much self-assured authority as any emperor. What do you want? she demanded. The king was taken aback. He stuttered. Uh, To cross this hill, to see the valley. 
This is my hill. These are my lands. Why do you want to cross them? Regaining some of his composure, the king said, I will conquer all of England to rule it as one kingdom under me. Ah, yes, of course. Now as it happens, I know a little of such things, and her modesty belied the power in her words. No one listening could doubt that somehow this old woman knew all there was to know about such matters and many others besides. Well, king, seven strides more shalt thou take, and if long Compton thou canst see, king of England shalt thou be. Long Compton was a village in the valley, just over the brow of the hill. It will be easily visible from the top of the hill. The king took a careful look at the ground in front of him, mentally measured up the distance to the top. It was seven strides. He'd be at the top of this hill, he'd see Long Compton, and he'd become king. He didn't know why he believed this old woman, but he did. He would take really big strides, just in case. Stick, stock and stone, as king of England I shall be known, cried the king. This bit is a little dated, but we need it for the rhyme. So, stick, stock and stone was a more common expression back then, and it basically meant the whole nine yards, the whole shebang, the kit and caboodle, the full Monty, the whole shooting match. You know, English has a surprising amount of phrases for the same thing, so we probably just got rid of stick, stock and stone just to try and control the numbers. Anyway, stick, stock and stone, as king of England I shall be known. And the king took his long strides. But as he stepped into the seventh, and Long Compton could almost be seen, a low bank of grass and earth rose up from the ground right in front of him, as if the very meadow was pulled up by invisible hands. As his foot fell and seven strides were complete, the mound completely blocked his view. An icy chill ran through the king. The woman, hell, let's not mince words, the witch, spoke up. As long Compton thou canst not see, King of England thou shall not be. Rise up stick and stand still stone, For King of England thou shalt not be known. Thou and thou men grey stone shall be, And I myself an elden tree. A deep dread rose from within the king. He would turn to flee, But in horror he realised that his body No longer responded to his command. The terrible nature of his last moments, watching his body petrify from his feet upwards, the sheer agony of still flowing blood hitting stone, then becoming stone itself. He was utterly helpless, and his body twisted and warped, but very soon thoughts troubled him no longer, and where he had been stood, there was now just a great grey stone. At least the king had a notion of what might be happening to him. For the men of his army assembled in a circle, there was no such warning, as that awful enchantment spread to them, and they too found their own live flesh turned to dead stone. And whatever intrigue those five knights had been plotting, died with their last breath, as they too were caught up in the spell, to stand immortalised in their huddle. And the witch, good to her word, turned herself into an elder tree, though perhaps that was what she had always been. The sets of stones, that is the king's men, the king and the whispering knights, have stood still as time has marched on around them. They can be found there today, and elders can be found growing around them still. They are known collectively as the Rollwright Stones, and it is said that on Midsummer's Eve, if you cut into an elder tree around them, then blood will flow from it. And it's just possible that on that night, the king's stone may shift ever so slightly. The mound that rose up in front of the king lasted for centuries, but by the present day it has been ploughed down. The view of Long Compton is no longer obscured. 
and so it may be that one day the curse will be lifted, and the king and his men will take form once again, and begin again their task of conquering England. If they do, they're probably going to be surprised by a few of the changes. But for now, they and the Elder Tree Witch remain steadfast in that spot. Now for our final tale of the day, we're going to leave the stone circles of southwest England and head north, north, north. Almost as far north as you can get while still being in the British Isles. In the podcast to date, we have, to my shame, been a little light on tales from Scotland. But when it comes to stone circles, we really can't ignore it. More than a third of the stone circles in the British Isles are in Scotland, and a lot of those are on the islands off the Scottish mainland. The Hebrides and the Orkneys have lots of standing stones, and along with Shetland they also play host to wheelhouse, burial chambers, brocks, cairns, and basically a wealth of Stone Age, Bronze Age and Iron Age sites, going back many thousands of years. For this story, we're going to the Outer Hebrides, and specifically to Lewis and Harris, one island with two names. Now, Lewis and Harris is the third biggest island in the British Isles, larger in area than Greater London, And yet, it's home to only a few thousand people. Today, it's easy for it to feel like a remote place, a land on the edge of the North Atlantic, far away from the hustle and bustle of the urban centres of the world. But four and a half thousand years ago, it was a very different story indeed. And the island was a hotspot of Neolithic and Bronze Age activity. And a lot of the standing stones and stone circles erected then have survived the passage of time. Probably the most famous of the stone circles on Lewis, the northern part of the island, are the Callanish stones. The stones of this circle are somewhat svelte compared to, say, those at Stonehenge. Flattish, relatively thin and tall, made of local nice stone. That's the name of the type of stone, though it's also probably quite nice. Light grey with swirling white patterns and with the layered metamorphic rock clearly visible from the side. There's a central circle of 13 stones, and within that is a chambered tomb, though this was a later addition, a kind of 1980s double-glazed conservatory for the circle. There are four other lines of stones leading into the circle, kind of very roughly, aligned to the cardinal directions. The longest line in has two rows of stones, kind of forming an avenue approaching the circle. On nearby hills, there are other groups of stone circles as well. You've got a bit of a complex, really. Now, unusually for stories about stone circles, we start this one with the stones already in place. And now, for the first time ever, we've got a kind of crossover between the discussion section of the podcast and the stories. Because if you've been listening for a while, you will know that 19th century folklore collectors are our reoccurring character archetype in the discussion section. And now, they've bled into the stories themselves, for our protagonist is indeed a 19th century folklore collector. Well, kind of. He'd probably call himself an antiquarian. It was the latter half of the 19th century. By this point, folklore collection was all the rage. In Scotland, it was over half a century since James Macpherson had first brought his controversial tellings of Highland tales to a receptive European audience and helped kickstart the Romanticism movement. Walter Scott burst onto the scene a little later, bringing Scottish folklore and history to the masses. And the Grimms, amongst others, had reinvigorated a general interest in folk tales amongst the intelligentsia right across the continent of Europe, and an explosion in interest in the subject had followed. By the end of the century, antiquarianism, which is basically a kind of local history combined with folklore, was maybe not the mainstream interest amongst the money classes, but it was pretty big. Not the pop megastar level, but indie rock maybe. And for over a century, the Scottish Society of Antiquaries have been doing work collecting information and artefacts from Scottish culture and assembling them in Edinburgh. 
our particular antiquarian and fellow of the society is not named. But he was an old man at this point, and he had a leisure time to pursue his hobby as much as he wished. He had made the journey to Lewis in June, for he wished to see the Kalner stones for midsummer. The antiquarian had spent time on the island as a child. He remembered those holidays fondly, and he remembered the tales he was told on them. Tales of how the stones came to be. I say tales because there was disagreement. One tale holds that, in days of yore there was a priest king, who hailed from a distant land where the people looked different. He sailed to Lewis with a vast fleet of ships, just turning up out of nowhere one day. And this priest and his people, they brought with them the stones. The high priest wore a robe of pure white feathers, and the lesser priest in his retinue wore multicoloured robes composed of the bright feathers and skins of many birds, many of which were unknown in the islands. <laughs> It was they who erected the Kalanish stone circle, though the work was hard even for them, and some died in the process, and they were buried in great and strange ceremonies, right inside the circle. When the work was complete, many left, sailed away again, but the high priest and some of his followers remained. And in time they invited the men from the other islands to join them, well, to serve them. And while that might not seem like the most attractive proposition, their power was alluring, and the men came. And the men reported back about the high priest, and how he was accompanied by wrens that flew around him at all times. The tiny wren, smallest of British birds, has, like the cuckoo, much association with druids and Celtic pagan beliefs. No, no, would cover another voice when the tale was recounted. A voice with a broad accent from the islands, of course, which I am making no attempt to force here. No, you see, everyone knows the stones were once the giants, the original rules of this land. For a while, the giants and normal men lived together, as they did across much of Scotland. But when the word of Christ started to spread amongst the men of the islands, the giants were alarmed. They met together in a great council, to decide what to do about the presence of the Lord in their remote, ungodly place. Unfortunately for them, St. Kieran came upon them there, and he demanded that the giants either be christened or build him a church. They didn't really go for this proposal, which offered little. And because of this refusal, as is a pretty standard mode of operating for the merciful and beneficent Christian God and his followers, Kieran used his divinely granted powers to turn each and every one of the giants into a stone slab. Which was completely justified because of their rejection of the unconditional love of Christ. And there the giants stand to this day. Yet our mainlander antiquarian wasn't so much interested in these stories as he was the ones he'd been told about the use of the stones to this day. He recalled what he'd been told as a boy very well. Though those summer days might have been almost an entire lifetime ago, he remembered clearly that when he had been young, an old man of the island with whom he had been staying told him many an interesting tale. And now he was old, he wanted to investigate their truth. And likely he wanted to preserve that truth and show it to people. If it was tangible enough, he'd do so in the museum on the mound. And if not, he could present a paper. During his trip to the island, he was staying at the castle, which, despite its name, was actually a Victorian manor house. It had a sideline as a kind of high-class B&B, playing host to the great and the good from the mainland whenever they came to the island. From the lounge of the castle in Stornoway, the antiquarian liked to hold court. He would tell anyone who would listen, and those within earshot of those who would listen, all about the tales he had been told. You see, that old man, he told me that people here from these islands that they still went to the stone circle, but in secret to avoid the church. They went on May Day and in Midsummer, and on Midsummer they'd arrive the night before. They'd gather round and they'd wait. As Midsummer dawn approached and the sun rose, something 
came to the stones. Something walked down the avenue. Heralded by the cries of the cuckoos, he told me. The more romantic in the audience, those mainlanders inclined to flights of fancy, felt their hairs rising. But you see, that's not all. He told me the name of this something that comes. And I didn't know it as a boy, but I wrote the word down. And years later, when I became involved with the society, I found myself in the company of the greatest Celtic scholars of the land. And I still had that word written down. How very convenient, interjected one listener. The antiquarian ploughed on. It wasn't Gaelic, I knew that. The scholars consulted, read books, went away, came back. They were of one opinion. It wasn't Gaelic, no. But it belonged to the root language common to all British Celtic languages. A root word. And what did it mean? There was not an exact English translation. But what they agreed upon was it meant something like the shining one, the pure one, the white one. A word that might be used to denote a god. This word was used on this island many centuries after it should have disappeared. And that's why I'm determined to go and see the sunrise on Midsummer's Day myself. Find out if there's any truth in these legends. Sometimes the antiquarian got carried away. Would he find here a pre-Christian cult still being observed amongst the peoples of these islands? Though there were significant doubts, a few of the other guests had their interest piqued enough to accompany the man on his trip. Men only, though, not because of any worries of safety, and only slightly because of Victorian misogyny, but more because it was rumoured on the island that marriages consummated within the circle will be particularly fortunate and should a number of male and female visitors wander up to the circle together on Midsummer's Day, well, I think to put it bluntly, the castle's owners didn't want the rumour to start amongst the locals that they were operating a standing stone, sea and sex package holiday deal, even if that does sound like a guaranteed money spinner. Alternately, we should probably consider the possibility that this was all an excuse given by the various women, who didn't really want to get up at a stupid o'clock in the morning to go and see if they could find a cult that has survived since Celtic times, as that seemed neither likely nor particularly sensible. Interestingly enough, an elderly maid who worked at the castle, overhearing of the gentleman's plans, reassured the women that they wouldn't be missing much at all. Nothing happens up there then. Oh, I didn't say that. But there'll be a mist up there on Midsummer's morning, you see. A thick one, and they won't be able to see anything that might interest them. The elderly woman said this with the same certainty and matter-of-factness with which one might state that water is wet. Cryptically, she added, it is only those to whom it is given that may see. The party of men set out from Stornoway very early in the morning, by carriage or horseback, for the stones were some miles distant. As they travelled, the antiquarian expanded some more on the tales he had heard. Do you know, when I was here as a boy, they told me that some of the families on the island were treated specially, treated in high esteem, for the families were said to belong to the stones. And what does that mean exactly? asked one of his companions. Well, I don't quite know, but... Remember I was telling you the legend about the people who came from far away? Well, and he left it hanging. It had been a bright, clear night when they started out, but as they got closer to the western side of the island and to the stones, a thick mist had descended, shrouding a landscape all around them. Even finding the circle's rough location was not the simplest of tasks. When they did, they had to kind of grope their way to it, along the avenue and up to the stones. And you know what? They were sure that they could make out figures. There were people there. But the fog all around them was of the densest sort, and they couldn't make anything out clearly. But eventually they made their way into the circle itself, 
the stones loomed ominously above the little party. The tomb was there, but of the people, there was no sign at all, and beyond the boundaries of the circle was only the swirling mist and the sounds of the wind. They suddenly felt very remote, very isolated, and a slight chill ran through them. The feeling of the whole place was quite the opposite of what might be expected on dawn and midsummer's morning. That should be a time of light and gaiety. This was an oppressive darkness, and while the sun might be rising somewhere, the little party certainly couldn't see it. What's that? started the antiquarian. The others followed his gaze. And he was right. There appeared to be grey shapes moving around in the fog. They walked towards the shape with that assured pluck of gentlemen everywhere, probably shouting something like, Hey, you! But when they reached the spot outside the circle where they were sure the thing had been, there was nothing there. And then the noises started up. Strange, eerie sounds. They still didn't panic, such was not in their nature, but they did explore around the circle, following the sounds that seemed to come from this direction and then that. After a number of false starts, there, a shape in the mist, there was a rough strange noise and as they approached the shape didn't dissipate, it got more solid, more visible, they rushed towards it and there they beheld it. cow rubbing its back against the stones. The mist hadn't lifted by the time they decided to leave and head back. The antiquarian was disappointed of course, but not dejected, and as they left they heard the distinctive call of the cuckoo coming from the moors and the hills all around them. And it was very strange, the antiquarian said, as cuckoos were birds of trees not moors, and furthermore they would not call in the fog. I can only imagine that by this point, his claim was met with only the most wearily feigned interest. And yet by the time they got to Stornoway on the journey back, there was no mist at all. And that really is that. The antiquarian never did get to deliver his paper. And as for the families of stone, do they still exist? Well. Maybe you could go to Lewis yourself and try to find out. But if you do, then do remember that it is only those to whom it is given may see. And that's all the stories for this episode. There really was a huge editing process in this one, and so many stories ended up on the cutting room floor. A lot of them for being fairly repetitive on the themes we've already covered, particularly around petrification, but others just because there wasn't time. It feels like I could fairly easily have done four or five episodes just on this topic. Now, one of the things that really interested me in telling these stories was that they all placed the creation of the stones after they were really made. Yes, they were created far more magically, but this must be one of the very few instances where the kind of unbelievable reality of the sheer age of these circles actually surpasses the legends about them. You may have noticed, by the way, that I have a genuine love of stone circles. I find them to be fascinating and magical places. I heard the word numinous recently, and I kind of feel that I should weave that in somewhere. But I genuinely find it an accurate way to describe the sacred, spiritual feel of these places. A feeling that is accessible even if you don't have a particular religious view on these things. A feeling of wonder that can be purely secular. 
Now, I know we had a big bit of discussion about stone circles at the head of the episode, so I'm going to keep this in expert discussion brief, but just to talk a little bit about each of the specific stories we've told in turn. Stanton Drew and the Wedding. Now, this is probably a variant of the most common folktale about stone circles, and indeed standing stones as well. The wedding aspect is actually pretty unique. The more usual variant of this tale is fairly similar, but just has people, usually women, dancing into the Sabbath, which is of course a terrible thing to do, and you probably do deserve to turn to stone. And those of us who have been to nightclubs in Britain will know that dancing always stops at 11.59 precisely to avoid the fate of those poor people at Stanton Drew. It's this association which is why we get stone circles with names like the Nine Ladies or the Merry Maidens or similar. Often there will be an associated stone which represents musicians who in those tales did play on, typically fiddlers or pipers, which might be in the middle of the circle or slightly off to one side. In that case the devil might not be present and just everyone gets turned to stone for Sabbath dancing. And you can certainly see why the ring shapes really lend themselves to the idea of a dance. And in many ways I find this the most pleasing type of explanatory story. It makes a kind of sense, and it makes far more sense than the army standing in a ring in the Roll Ride Stone story. Now there's clearly a kind of anti-female take to many of these tales. In the wedding at Stanton Drew it's notable that the women really want to continue, and the men kind of take a back seat. But there are male versions of this tale as well. Typically in the case of men, rather than dancing, they are said to be playing sport on a Sunday. Dreadful business. The hurlers in Cornwall are perhaps the primary example of this. I find one of the odder aspects about the generic Sabbath breakers turned to stone story is that in some of these stories it's the devil who is doing the punishing of the people, while in some cases it's God or a Christian saint. And basically, the two are indistinguishable. The God who hates people dancing on the Sabbath is very much a vengeful, no-nonsense God. And where the devil does appear, as in the Stanton Drew story, he's basically just performing middle management duties. He doesn't have a stake in punishing these guys. He's just following God's rules assiduously. I prefer the cool bad boy rebel devil myself. Anyway, moving on from that one, the Rollwright Stones. This legend is actually relatively unique to this particular place, probably because it combines together the specific monuments at the Rollwright site. The stone circle itself, the King's Stone, which is a solitary standing stone, and the Whispering Knights, which it probably wasn't clear from the tale, but those are what's called a dolmen tomb, and that's a tomb made of stones with a stone on top, but in the case of the Whispering Knights, the top stone has actually fallen off. Apart from being the best name for a Rolling Stones tribute act, the Rollwright Stones have long been regarded as one of England's premier heritage sites, and along with Stanton Drew and Stonehenge, they were one of the very first to be protected in an 1882 Act of Parliament. Now, while the legend of the army, which dates back about 400 years by the way, is fairly unique to the site, it also has associated with it other folklore, which is more widespread about lots of stone circles. These aren't real stories as such, but just to give you a flavour of some of the things that are said, of a great many stone circles, the stones are said to be uncountable. If you count them multiple times, you will always get a different number. Now occasionally, clever people try methods to beat this strange effect. A baker, who must really wanted to have counted the stones, placed a loaf of bread on each stone. As he knew how many loaves he had started with, some simple arithmetic when he was done would tell him the answer to the question, how many stones? Taps head. Clever, yeah. Round the baker went, placing a loaf on each stone. When he was finished, he looked back and, hey, there wasn't a loaf on that one. He went back to the missing one, put one of his remaining loaves on it. Right, now, wait, there wasn't a loaf on that one either and so on and so on, and soon enough he was out of loaves. Lo and behold, there were still loaves missing, and he had no idea how many stones were in the circle. Now, this is obviously a fairly testable piece of folklore, and King Charles II is amongst the people who has tried to disprove it on a trip to Stonehenge. But if you're actually trying it, 
you've probably lent it a fair degree of credence in the first place. Now before we leave the roll rights, and this is such an aside, but near the village of Long Compton, there used to be a village called Compton Scorpion. And that's it. English place names. Even when you think you've heard the best, there's always another absolutely bizarre one just waiting for you. Turning to the Kalanish stones and the story of them. It's probably a bit of a cheat for me to call that a story. It's kind of a vehicle to tell the legends. And unlike the other stories, which you can find in many records, it comes from one source, and one relatively late source, Otter Swire. Otter was a Scottish folklorist in the mid-20th century. She wrote about folklore, history, and the present day in her accounts of various parts of Scotland and its islands. Her work is a genuine pleasure to read, and I'd really recommend it for just lots of interesting snippets, part travelogue, part folk tales, and now reading them 60 years on, a look back into a present that has now also long gone. The antiquarian story is related as a real tale, with Otter's mother being present at the castle when the expedition to the stones occurred. In my own trip to Kalnish, also in summer, it was rainy and wet and misty, so it seems like a perfectly plausible tale. It's also an unusual tale in that it actively ties back the stones to the idea of Celtic Druidism, which itself is a view formed by antiquarians and historians in the 17th and 18th centuries. In my telling of the story I very much leaned into the idea of the man as an interloper and an outsider, and I should take this opportunity to emphasise the fictional nature of the commentary in that short tale, especially around the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland. The Society, which still exists today, actually does a lot of interesting work promoting the study of Scottish history and culture, and its early work in the 19th century formed the basis of the National Museum of Scotland in Edinburgh, and that is a museum which is well worth a visit. I included the story as it was slightly different, and also because it was just nice to have one of those folklore collectors pop up in a tale. Anyway, that's about it for this episode. A big thank you again to everyone who's left comments and reviews. There's been some lovely ones recently. Next time, we'll be starting on a new series of episodes, looking at Branch 2 of the Mabinogion, which includes some seriously weird stuff. Helpfully, there's no need to listen to the Branch 1 episodes already. Why not go and do that while you wait for it to come out? You can follow Tales of Britain and Ireland podcast on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. There's also a website, talesofbritainandireland.com, where there's a page for each episode which contains more information including illustrations, asides and recaps, along with other additional bits and pieces to explore. The intro music was written and performed by Alice Nichols, and you can find all the other musical credits on the episode page on the website. If you enjoyed this podcast then please do share it with others or give it a review, as those really are the best ways to help us out. You can also join Tales of Britain and Ireland on Patreon to get extra members episodes. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join me again soon.